you're here today and you've not been here before, I always mention before I start that through the door on the right-hand side, there are outlines back there. You know, in the last few weeks, I've been preaching a series of topics that are very similar. You know, a few weeks ago, a, a brother had asked that I would preach on a topic, and as I thought about that topic, I thought there are numerous other topics that would go well with it. And so I've, even though I didn't announce it, really been preaching a series of sermons, and I hope this morning to really tie this up. I think it's important this morning that we spend a little bit of time talking about reactions to God's Word. You'll remember in the last few weeks, I've, I spent some time talking for a while about evangelism and the need of evangelism in the church, and then I began to talk about how a Christian's actions in all manner of their life should be based on the Scripture. And then I began to talk about last week how all Christians need to be involved in their local congregation. All these activities that I've, I've just mentioned, every one of them demands that we as Christians hear the Word, that we know the Word, and that we spend a lot of time discussing God's Word. And so I thought today we ought to spend a little bit of time walking through the Scriptures to see really some of the common reactions we find when that takes place. It's been said that the same sun that hardens clay also melts wax. And I think that's exactly true when you begin to talk about God's Word. God's Word doesn't always affect one person just like it affects another. And I think as we talked about the parable of the sower uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we see a good example there. Matthew begins to talk about the, the four kinds of soil. We know that there was a seed that was planted in each of those types of soil, and we know that there was a different reaction from each one of them. We know that uh, one of those soils never received the seed. We know that out of the other three they did, and yet the reaction of all of those soils were extremely different. And so what we understood as we looked at the parable, and we spent a little bit of time about it, is that the condition of one's heart is going to determine whether or not they accept the Word of God. Our hearts have to be good and honest and ready to accept His truth. And as I thought about this, it really occurred to me that it's not just enough to have a good and honest heart when we become a Christian or when we're added to the, to the church, but we've got to continue to seek after that truth and that righteousness. We have to continue to have that mindset. With that being said, I thought really what we ought to do is spend a lot of time talking about reactions to God's Word. And that's important because it helps us to examine our response to God's Word, but also the response that we receive from others as we talk about God's Word. And I think our first example, and it's where we read from right before I walked up, is a great example. Many of you know the example here I'm going to go to. It's the Bereans. There's not really a whole lot said to us about the Bereans, but if you know anything about the Bereans, you do know that they had an admirable trait. It's said of them in Acts 17, 11 through 12, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. I'll be honest, I don't really think there's a better compliment that could be said of anybody who, who claims to be a follower of God. What we find here is they did receive the word, and they searched. These were people who, who, when they had been told something, they were diligent to try to find out if what they were being told was correct. You know, I've told you before that, that, that you shouldn't believe me. Don't, don't believe me just because I'm, I'm a preacher. Don't believe anything you read just because maybe it came from an institution that's always been associated with the church. And that may not, may, may not seem like that's you know, a positive thing to say or really even a positive outlook to have on life, but here's the thing. What I mean by that statement is you need to verify that I am telling you the truth, not just me. When you read something, even if it comes from the name that you've known since you were a child, you, you need to verify what they're writing in there. I began to think about this, and you know, each of us as Christians, we have an obligation. We have an obligation to verify all of the things that are being taught, whether it's from behind this pulpit, whether it's in our, our Bible classes on Wednesday, when it's uh, the morning class on Sunday. Each congregation needs to spend a lot of time. And as I thought about this, in reality, I think one of the easiest ways to sum it up is, is a sound congregation is a transparent Congregation. When I say a transparent congregation, what I mean is this. Everything that we do is known by everybody else that's here. 
A transparent congregation is a congregation which has a lot of communication. And so therefore I understand that, that everything that's taught in this building, whether it's behind the pulpit, whether it's on Sunday morning during Bible class, whether it's taught in a ladies class, whether it's taught downstairs to our youth, everything that's being taught needs to be known by everyone else who's in the building. And everything that's being taught, except for possibly an individual class, maybe that was designed for, let's say, married people, ought to be, design, ought to be designed for every single member of the church. There ought to be nothing that, that I couldn't be taught or be retaught as I sat down and listened to the two-year-olds being taught. It might actually be a good time for me to go back and remember some of those things that I'd forgotten. Same way as when we sit upstairs and talk, many of the things that I teach they should be easy enough to be grasped for a young one up in the audience of six, seven years old to get the basics. We've got to be a transparent congregation. I want to tell you, parents, if you've got children here and they're being taught downstairs, you need to ask them every day, what were you taught today? You need to know. It's important that you know. As a matter of fact, husbands, ask your wife what she was taught in ladies' Bible class. Ladies, ask your husband if he was attending some type of a men's class. We ought to be talking about the Sunday sermon. We ought to be talking about what was talked about in Bible class. And you may say, why is that? If we get to the point where we, we stop checking, we trust and we just quit checking, I'll be honest with you, we are only one agenda away from going into error. And you may say, that sounds extreme. If you think so, attend a few of the congregations around us. I'm not being extreme. We need to be talking about all of the things and checking all of the things that we're told. You know, I would hope that I never make a mistake up here, but I also hope that if I do, you check it, verify it, and come let me know so I can correct it. And that's what the Brians did. This attitude that these Brians had, it's what God desires. Notice again, they received the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. They searched the scriptures daily. Ask yourself, how, how many of you search the scriptures daily? Let me give you some startling statistics, and I actually think they're inflated, actually. The statistics that I found as I studied for this sermon was that in the United States, 88% of people claim to own a Bible. Out of those who took that survey, 57% of them said they read their Bible less than four times per year. Surprisingly, 26% of them did say they read their Bible four times or more per week. But on average, what we find, and if you were to be honest with yourself, is that many people do not fall into the category of 26% of people reading their Bible four times per week. Matter of fact, there are many people who when they leave will just, and I hope they have more than one Bible, but they leave it on the chair here in the building when they leave. Uh, I remember at the last building I would see Bibles laying around. I often would wonder to myself, are they actually reading them through the week? Do they have another one? I know that most of us do. We've got to have this good heart that Matthew described in the parable of the sower. The Bereans had it. We've got to have this, this mentality where we're going to receive the word and we're going to go back and test all those things that we've heard. These Bereans, it's interesting how they're described. He says that they searched the scriptures daily. If you don't know much about that word in the Greek, here's, here's what this word means. It means they scrutinized, they investigated, they interrogated, they determined... They asked, they questioned, they discerned, they examined, they judged. All of that goes along with that word searched. Here's the, here's the point. They were told something. They didn't know if it was true or not. So what did they do? They did exactly what anybody who, who would claim to be a Christian would do. Is they started to, or a follower of God at that time, they started to, be, to study the scriptures. They wanted to know, is what this person's telling me, is it accurate? You know, sometimes... We get to the point where we know that we, or we think that we know everything. You ever talk to somebody like that? It's a very dangerous situation when we begin to have an attitude like that. I hope that most of you are like myself where you say, I gain a little more knowledge every day, but there are still things that I don't know. There are still areas where if, if I took someone on their word and didn't go back and, and double check it, I could be deceived. And so we... We understand one of the reactions we have here of the Bereans is really the reaction that most of us as Christians, all of us as Christians really ought to have. We ought to have this mindset, I need to double check it. I need to make sure. I need to verify. 
2 Timothy 2.15, Paul gives it to us in this manner. He says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I guess if we were to sum up the, the Bereans in a nutshell, it would be this. They were the kind of people who had honest hearts. They were the kind of people that when they were told something, they didn't just believe it. They went back and they wanted to search and to make sure that it was accurate. And I'll be honest, as, as Christians, if we want to protect not only ourselves and our families, but our own congregations, we need to do this in, in regards to everything. What we read on Facebook, what, what people send us in the email, what we hear in Bible study, what we hear in our sermons, every single thing needs to be checked and rechecked. We see another attitude uh, or reaction to the Word of God given to us from the Sanhedrin. This is a group that they got angry. Well, if you go back and, and you study, you'll find that Stephen was preaching. We don't, we don't have a whole lot of information about Stephen. As a matter of fact, there's only one sermon recorded of Stephen, Acts 7, verses 1 through 53. And I actually would like to read all of that right now, but I won't because I don't have that much time. But let me summarize his sermon for you very quickly. He basically stood in front of those men and he told them that from the very beginning there was a prophecy that there would be a Messiah. And he tells them that the Messiah did indeed come, and then he tells them, guess what, you killed him. And the reaction was that of anger. Listen to the reaction recorded in Acts 7, 54 through 60. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with, with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down, and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. He stands before them, Stephen does, and he begins to proclaim God's word, talking about the prophecies, how they really should have known the prophecies and that they, in fact, had killed the Messiah. And they heard the word of God and were filled with rage, filled with anger. You know, sometimes, and let's be honest, people will become angry at the messenger. And I'm not just talking about the guy who stands behind a pulpit. There are times when you'll sit down and you'll tell somebody, you know, what you believe here is not in accordance with the Bible, or I'm aware of what you did not long ago and that's not in accordance with the Bible, or, you know, you're not living a lifestyle and the list goes on and on, and they become angry, right? Stephen didn't preach to them because he wanted to make somebody mad. What you find out is Stephen preached because souls were lost. Stephen preached to those who were in authority who already thought they had all the answers. Stephen preached to them, to these people who had by their own wicked hands killed our Lord and Savior. And he goes through and he talks about the prophecies. You know, we need to remember as we look back at the scriptures, our Lord and Savior was betrayed by his own brethren, by his own people. And you may say, why would you bring that up? You know, there are times when we ourselves may be misled by a brother or a sister in Christ. Maybe unknowingly, maybe knowingly. We have, to, we have to think about those things. The reaction of these people when they were given the scriptures was be, they became angry. Matter of fact, they really became filled with rage. And you may say, well, why is it so hard to hear somebody sometimes read the scriptures or, or give the scriptures to you? And the reason is because nobody likes to be told that they messed up. Nobody, nobody likes to be told that they're wrong. Matter of fact, the words cut them to the heart. Hebrews 4.12, we understand that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Think about it. It cuts coming and going, right? You feel it when it goes in, and you feel it when it comes back out. Why? Because that's how sharp God's Word is. Matter of fact, it's that same sharpness that causes people to obey the gospel. But the Bible says in Acts 7.54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on Him with their teeth. Heard the Word of God, and it cut them. And they were angry. You see a very similar account with Peter and the apostles. Acts 5.33, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart, and they took counsel to slain. In both cases, these people, they were angry. They got cut to the heart, and they were angry. In Stephen's case, he lost his life. In Peter's case, he did not. 
let's face the fact that sometimes the reaction to the preached word is people become angry. And we really ought not to be surprised by that. It's just another common example given to us in the scriptures. Another would be when Paul preached at Mars Hill. He got two different types of reactions. Acts 17, 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we will hear thee again on, of this matter. You know, it's interesting when Paul shows up there, they give him this request. Listen to what they say in Acts 17, 9 through, 19 through 21. And they took him and they brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Paul begins to, begins to talk to them, and they're intrigued, as a matter of fact. And they tell him, you know, we want you to, to explain to us what you're talking about here. We want to be able to, to get our hands wrapped around it. And so Paul begins to preach to them about the unknown God. Acts 17, 23. It says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Well, he's starting off that sermon with a bang, isn't he? He tells them right off the bat, you ignorantly worship this God. But why don't you give me an opportunity and I'll tell you all about him. Well, the reaction of the crowd was twofold. Upon hearing of the resurrection of the dead, some of them began to mock him. They began to make fun of him. And the second group says, you know, we will, we will hear thee again on this matter. Apparently, they were a little bit intrigued by it. You ever been told that by somebody? I'll hear thee again on this matter. I've been told that before. I've been told, you know, I, I need to hear this, but I don't really want to hear it today. I had somebody tell me one time that when he got a little older, he might think about becoming a Christian. That's not something you like to hear from a family member, is it? I know I need to hear it, but I don't want to hear it today. You know why people tell you things like that? Because they enjoy their current life too much to give up what you want them to give up, what the Bible tells them to give up, to be faithful. Sometimes you'll try to teach somebody the gospel, or you'll tell somebody that, that they're involved in sin, or you'll tell them that, that what they're doing is not in alignment. And what do they do? Exactly what we see here. Sometimes they begin to mock you. They begin to make fun of you. They'll begin to do whatever they can to try, to try to pull you down a little bit. And sometimes they'll give you the other response. Sometimes they actually know it's right. And they say, I'll hear you again sometime on that matter. But they don't want to hear you now. So when that happens to you, and it probably will, we'll be surprised because that's what the Bible shows us is a common reaction to God's word. Consider also the people of Antioch and Pisidia. They show us another reaction. Acts 13, 45 through 46 but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Let me summarize Paul's sermon for you real quick. Paul stood before these men and he began to preach about the wonders of God and about how God had been with them from the very beginning, how he had taken them out of, out of uh, Egypt. Paul said he brought them out of the land. And then he talks about how God had given them judges for the space of 450 years until they finally demanded to have their first king, King Saul, which he allowed. And then he begins to talk about David. Acts 13, 23, he says, Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior Jesus. He says the Bible prophesied there was going to be a man named Jesus, and guess what? He was risen up. And then he goes on and he begins to talk about John the Baptist. And he says John the Baptist came and he prepared the way for this Messiah. And Paul then turns his attention to their salvation. Acts 13, 26, he says, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. There was a Messiah. He says, I'm declaring to you the method of salvation, and they rejected salvation. Here's the point. You killed him. God raised him from the dead. 
He's the only way that you're going to be righteous in God's sight today. Acts 13, 38, and 39, he goes on and he covers it even more. And I want you to listen to this response closely because what he's saying is pretty much what we would say to someone today. He says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Here's his point. Your current manner of lifestyle will not allow you to get to heaven. The way you're living won't allow you to get to heaven. Is that what we tell people today when they're not members of the church? When they're living in sin? That's exactly what he's telling them then. A little bit different aspect. He's saying the law of Moses isn't going to save you today. You need to become a Christian. And we look at people and tell them, your current manner of life, the way you're living, that ain't going to save you today. You need to become a Christian. It's the exact same thing Paul was trying to get across to them. Notice their response. And I think it took a little while for the response to build up because we find out it's not really until, until the next Sabbath day when we see the Jews respond. And how do they respond? They're filled with envy. We see that they're angry. They began to speak, be, speak about the things that Paul had spoken about. They talked about them. They began to blaspheme God. It says that they put the word from them. You get the idea of pushing back. They didn't want that word. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want anything to do with it. They didn't want to obey. So what do they do? They, they, put it, they put it away from them. They reject it. Does that sound unusual in today's society when that happens? Isn't that actually pretty common? You give someone the word of God and they put it away from them. They reject it. Verse 46, they judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life. You know how that took place? Through their actions. That's how they judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life, through their actions. One of the things we have to understand, our actions make us worthy or unworthy. There's no separating action from a Christian's life according to the Word. We're told to, to do things and live a certain way, and those actions, they declare us as worthy or unworthy. And that's exactly what we see here with these Jews. How many people, though, today do the exact same thing when they've heard the gospel? They declare themselves unworthy of everlasting life. How many people today do the exact same thing after they've been added to the church and declare themselves unworthy of everlasting life when they walk out the doors and they don't come back? Or they choose to live in a manner that's not in alignment with the scriptures? We had the same thing today. Another example is Felix. Most of us are familiar with King Felix. Acts 24, verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. You know, Paul starts off in this chapter defending himself. He's held at first, and then he's called by Felix to come and to, to speak. And Paul comes before him, and he begins to teach. And Felix is listening. He hears everything that Paul's saying about his faith in Christ. And notice his response again, Acts 24, 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. There's a response taking place by hearing the word of God. And he answered, go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. The way that's described there, he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, judgment to come. Doesn't that sound like a good gospel sermon today? I think that's usually what you find here. There was a reaction from Felix. He trembled. One of the things I understand here is, is Felix was very clear on what Paul was teaching. He was clear enough that there was a reaction caused by it. You know, if somebody heard the Word of God and really just didn't get it and didn't understand it, you wouldn't get a response from them. He hears the Word of God, and not only does he hear it, he has to understand it because he trembles. And then he says, Go thy way for this time when it's more convenient. I'll call you. The truth made him tremble, and yet the problem was he was so hard-hearted he was so hard-hearted that he, he couldn't react to it. And he says, come back when it's more convenient. Doesn't that happen today, though? You may say, well, I don't know if it really happens that much. It happens all the time when people come into a building and either are not baptized and hear that they need to be added to the church and how to be added to the church, and they sit in the seat because they can't do it. I actually had one gentleman say, as he sat in the seat, he knew he needed to come forward because sometimes it's not baptism. Sometimes it's another reason. He sat in the seat and he said, 
I had a hold of the chair in front of me. Ask yourself if you've ever done this. And I knew I needed to go up, but I couldn't let go. And I don't know why, but I couldn't let go. They hear the word of God. They, they want to react to it. They need to react to it, but they won't for some reason. Felix, for whatever reason, said, I'll hear you later on the matter. That happens to us even in the church. If we're honest with ourselves, you know why most people don't come forward? When either they're not baptized or when they are baptized and there's been an altar call? It's because of us. If nobody else was in the building and I preached to that one person and they heard it, they'd come down. But it's because they wonder what the rest of us are thinking. What is that person going to think? As Christians, what we ought to be thinking is we love them, and when they come down, one of us walks down and sits with them. If we did that every time, nobody would ever think twice about coming down the aisle. Felix, King Felix, he wasn't going to answer. We've got the, the rich young man. Most of you know the, this young ruler. He comes and he asks a question of the Lord. His reaction's also very similar today. You know, it's one of the things we learned from this account is we as Christians, we need to be prepared to answer questions. Here, Christ has is, is asked a question, and, and he's ready to answer him. We as Christians are oftentimes going to be answered questions, and they're going to vary, which means we've got to spend a lot of time studying so we can be prepared to answer whatever question that is. But this, this rich young ruler, he comes forward, and he, he asks a question. Matthew 19, 16, he says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, listen closely to this, What good thing shall I do? that I may have eternal life. You know, there's a lot of people in this world that have the exact same idea today. They have this idea that they can go around and do good things and that good things will get them into heaven. That's not taught anywhere in the Bible. But there are people that think that they've got this idea if my goods outweigh my bads, just maybe, maybe I have a chance. Well, we seem to forget that God is a God who desires that we serve. Matthew 7, 21 through 25, James 1, 21. Just being a good person doesn't save anybody. As a matter of fact, go back and read the account with Cornelius. Cornelius was a good person. Matter of fact, he was a devout man. He needed to be told how to be saved, didn't he? Same thing with people today in this world. But notice, notice what Christ said, Matthew 19, 17. He said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one. That's God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Well, first off, he, he acknowledges who he is just in his response. There's only, you call me good, there's only one who is good, and that's God. Christ was acknowledging that he was God, and then he says, you need to keep the commandments. The response is interesting from this young ruler. Matthew 19, 20, he says, all these have I kept from my youth. You know that I have no reason to believe he's not telling the truth there. Jesus didn't correct him. There are good people out there, and he may have even been living according, according to the word. I have no reason to believe what he's not saying is sincere and correct. But look at his next question. It shows you where his, his lack of understanding is. He says, what lack I yet? Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect or complete, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. You know, he may have followed all the laws. Jesus already knew what was in man. And Jesus knew this guy had a problem. He may have been following every single one of the laws, but he still had a problem. He told him to go and sell everything that he had. You know, there are people today who they'll be told what they ought to do to follow Christ, and they won't do it. They simply won't. And the reason is usually because they love something too much in this world. Notice this gentleman's response, Matthew 19, 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He may have been following the law uh, as accurately as he says he was, but he had a heart problem, didn't he? He had a problem with things. He had a problem with stuff. And that's exactly what we find oftentimes in the world today. People will hear the gospel and be told, as a Christian, this is how you ought to live, and they won't, they won't obey because they have a problem with either stuff or they want to do the things that they, they've done always. That's a common reaction. Another one, the Jews on the day of Pentecost when they heard Peter's sermon. They reacted to what was preached. Matter of fact, Acts 2.24, he talks about Jesus being resurrected. Uh, Peter's up there preaching about Jesus who'd been approved of God. And listen to what he says in the previous verse before he talked about the resurrection. 
He says in Acts 2, 23, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You know, we may not have made the decision like Pilate. Matter of fact, we may not have been one of the Jewish leaders who was there in the crowd saying, Crucify Him! But I'll tell you what, we may have been, actually, there's no may about it. We were guilty. It's our sins that put him up on that cross. It's our sins that kept him up on that cross. Those nails didn't hold him there. He willingly stayed there. He knew what the will of God was, and he knew what was needed for man to be able to be reconciled back to the Father. And that required the shed blood of somebody who was an innocent lamb, right? Our, nails put, our, our sins put him up on her. Those nails didn't keep him there. The reaction on that day of Pentecost when, when this is being told to them is the reaction that God desires when the gospel is preached. Peter stands and tells these people, there was the Messiah and you killed him. And he gives them all the information they would need to have an understanding of this. And their reaction, I'll be honest, is, is so sincere that this is the reaction that we wish we would hear every day. Acts 2.37 they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? I don't know exactly how it came across there, but in my mind when I hear it, I hear the urgency of the matter. The urgency of the matter was they understood that they were guilty of sin, and they understood they had to do something to deal with that sin. And so they wanted to know. That's one of the reactions that we as Christians are looking for. That's the reaction that we hope we'll get. But I'm going to close with one more. Most of us are familiar with the account. You go back and you begin to read about the Ethiopian eunuch. It's Acts 8, 26 through 39. And most of us know the account very well. As a matter of fact, the Ethiopian eunuch, he's riding in this chariot and he's, he's reading. Philip the evangelist comes up and he asks him if he understands what he's reading. And he says, well, how can I accept a man should come up and teach me? He didn't understand what he was reading. He needed somebody to help him. You know, that's going to happen occasionally. Sometimes people know that they don't understand. Other times people don't know that they don't understand. But they need someone to come up and teach them. And that's exactly what we find from Philip. Consider his reaction, the Ethiopian eunuch. And as he went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said this in Acts 8.37. He said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know, the Bible simply says in Acts 8.35, Then Philip opened his mouth, and he began at the same scripture, and he preached unto him Jesus. You ever wonder what's involved in preaching Jesus? I think people have this idea, not, not to say that I don't follow this format, but people have the idea that it's three points, some sub points, you finish it off, there's conclusion, right? That's kind of the format we follow. But that's not what you find here. What you find is Philip the Evangelist walked upon a man who didn't understand what he was reading, and he actually started right where the guy was and where he was confused, and it says, from there forward he preached Jesus. You want to know what's involved in preaching Jesus? You see it in this account, belief, repentance, confession, baptism. Why in the world would this eunuch request baptism? We don't actually see it being preached by Philip the Evangelist, and yet it says he preaches Jesus, and then he says, look, there's water. What doth prohibit me from being baptized? Clearly, that's part of what he was preaching, right? Philip had to have preached it. And so the eunuch here, he's baptized, he's baptized because Christ commanded it. Matthew 16, Matthew 20. Very clearly, this was part of what Philip the Evangelist was preaching. He was baptized because it's the likeness of, of Christ's death. It's the death, burial, and the resurrection. And without that watery grave, I tell you what, there is no newness of life. John 3, 3 through 5, Romans 6, 1 through 6. He was baptized because that's the only time he can come into contact with the blood when he becomes a Christian, right? He was baptized because that's how one gets into Christ, Galatians 3, 27. He was baptized because baptism saves, 1 Peter 3, 21. I'll be honest, that reaction right there with the Ethiopian eunuch, that reaction we see in Acts chapter 2, the reaction we get from the Bereans, those are all the positive reactions that we're looking for as we teach. But let's remember there's also the negative reactions. You've got those that are anger, 
angered, you got those who are filled with rage, those who are not sincere, those who don't want to hear. The list goes on and on. And why do I tell you all of that? As I started off, I mentioned that's important for two reasons. We need to be checking ourselves and how we react to the Word, but we also need to be prepared for how other people react to the Word of God. So here's the question, now that you've been told very quickly what the Gospel teaches, what's going to be your reaction today? How are you going to react? If you're here and you're not a Christian, are you going to believe the Gospel? Hebrews 11.6, is it going to cause you to have faith? Would it cause you to have the kind of faith that would cause you to repent of your sins because you understand that all people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 and 6.23, and because of that, there's this consequence you've got to repent of. Jesus himself told you to repent, Luke 13.3. Would it cause you to confess Christ, Matthew 10.32 and 33? It's also necessary unto salvation, Romans 10.10. If you're here and you're not a Christian, would you be baptized by immersion for the remission of sins? Jesus himself told you to. Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You know, we have to, we have to be very careful as Christians to judge everything. And, and I, I look at the positive examples with the brands. You know, as Christians, if we don't have that mindset of the brands to go back and to study and to compare and to check, we're going to have a hard time living faithfully. 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8 says, I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. You know that that following the faith is going to be determined on how you react to the Word of God. And how you react to the Word of God, hopefully, is in alignment with the good examples that I gave you as compared to the bad. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I urge you don't leave without talking to one of us. Let us spend some time teaching you the gospel, the necessity of it. If you're here and you're a Christian, you might be struggling with something. I don't know. Maybe you've not been living faithfully. Maybe you've done things you ought not to have done. Maybe you've brought reproach upon yourself, maybe upon the church. I don't know. Maybe you need to sit in, the, in your seat right there and pray quietly for, for forgiveness, 1 John 1, 9. And maybe if it was a matter of public action, you brought reproach upon yourself in the church, you need to come forward and, and ask the church to pray for you and to make it known. In either situation, you can do that as we stand and sing a song of invitation.